morning, Southside Bible Church, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me hear it. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Thanks, Tim. I could hear you back there, brother. Um, I just wanted to extend a, a special welcome to any of our guests who would be with us this morning. We are grateful to have you here to worship with us on such a, a blessed morning. As a church, we are studying through Romans. We've been in it for a few years Uh, We're pulling out to draw our attention and our worship of the incarnation, to look at God becoming flesh and dwelling among us. And so we're doing this through what you saw this morning, the Advent. Uh, Last week, we we looked at Isaiah chapter 9 at the great Christmas promise, 700 years before of the one who would be given to us, who would be born to us. And then, of course, the great Christmas hymns of the faith. This Friday night, we're going to draw our attention to John chapter 1, uh, verse 14, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and just really declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. This morning, I've had a a passage really deeply impressed on my heart. If you'd like to turn to it, it's in Matthew chapter 22, since Holly, Holly, Molly, and High's wedding, uh, I just, this is what I kind of preached at their wedding, and it's just been on my heart ever since, and I just wanted to keep looking at it and studying. So you guys probably don't remember anything about it, because you were kind of lost in each other. So this morning, I want you to look at me and not each other, and let's let's dig in. Wait a minute. Who's sitting behind you there? I thought you guys got married. Welcome. Is this your honeymoon? Southside Bible Church? Yeah. They got married yesterday. Welcome to the Sanchez's. Good to have you here. I thought I recognized that big grin over High's head. Just, <laughs> and I was like, that's my brother. Well, this morning then, we're going to look at Matthew 22, and I wanted to not look so much at the, the details of Christ's birth in the world that we looked at last week and what we've been looking at in the Advent, but I just want to focus this morning, why was he born into the world? Uh, you can get so lost in the incarnation that you forget why he came and why God entered into this world, for for what purpose. And this morning, I just want to look at the purpose of why God was incarnated into this earth that he created. And so this is all moving, Christ coming into the world. It's going to end in this amazing wedding feast in heaven at the end of the age with, with the bridegroom and his bride, the bride made perfect from every tribe, tongue, and nation, the elect of God purified and brought in as a gift to give to the bridegroom from the Father. And so the feast that Jesus told his disciples about in the Last Supper, he said in Matthew 26, I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. Revelation 19.7 says, let us rejoice the end of history and be glad and give glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It's where all of history is going. And then two verses later in verse 9, He said to me, write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And He said to me, these are true words of God. So I can't tell you how blessed you are if you've been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And and so that's what we're going to look at this morning, the climax of all of history a bride made perfect, given a garment that is pure and spotless, infinite righteousness, to celebrate our marriage with Christ forever. And there will never be a celebration like this one. It will be like no other. Amen? I love weddings. And one of the things I like about weddings is I usually get the best seat in the house. I get to sit there with the bride and groom, and that door opens up, and and there's just something special about it when the, the groom sees his bride, and they start squeezing your shoulder and making weird noises and guttural sounds. It's, it's probably one of my favorite parts at a wedding. But I, if I got to my favorite part, I think it's the reception. I just love afterwards. We, we enter in, and we have food, and there's dancing. Uh, any against dancing? I'm sorry. Um, there's dancing at a lot of these weddings. And there's rejoicing, and there's a bride and a groom, and, and I just love it because there's joy unparalleled, and we just, we celebrate. It's just, it's a, it's a foreshadowing of the day that I'm going to talk about this morning, and it's going to be the, the best feast ever. 
No, nothing will ever have matched it. It's eternal bliss and joy and celebration where every day will be better than the last, where every fairy tale or story has been pointing to in all of history, this feast. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. This is why Jesus was born in a manger, to make this possible, to fulfill the law and to pay the penalty for our transgressions of that law. His life on a cruel cross and the great resurrection make this possible to have the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so I'd like to join our hearts together this morning and look at Jesus' parable teaching us about this great uh, supper, this great feast that we have been invited to. So let's pray and open up the Word of God. Father, I come before you and I pray that every believer in Christ is, has his eyes fixed on this feast. God, we're longing for the day of celebration with the, all the saints made perfect and our bridegroom revealed in all of his perfection, and we will celebrate for all of eternity. God, that it is finished, it's done. Uh, all things uh, have been culminated and brought to completion with God, man, and the cosmos dwelling together in perfect unity. Oh God, what a celebration this will be. I pray this morning, lift every heart with the joy of, of what awaits us. And so Lord, thank you for this blessed promise. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Matthew 22, I want to set the context for us this morning. Uh, Matthew does one of the best jobs, I think, of any gospel writer, giving us the details and the specifics of the birth of Jesus Christ. Him and Luke are my two favorite accounts of that. And he shows us that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah for thousands of years in the Old Testament. He was the one that it had been speaking and prophesying of. The, the king, he, he shows the kingship of Christ. Here is the king, the greater David, whose kingdom will have no end. And Jesus now goes around teaching and speaking about the kingdom of God. And he's been manifesting its power and in, in miracles and healings of showing the power of God in him. And through the gospel of Matthew, there, there's this growing enmity and animosity with him and the religious of the day. As you journey the gospels, it just keeps escalating. The more he manifests himself, the more the religious are growing in their hatred of him. The Pharisees and the scribes are not rejoicing in the God-man. They weren't hearkening the herald. The hatred is growing, and it's going to end with them finally putting him up on a cross. And in chapter 1, Jesus quits hiding and leaving cities and slipping away as they were trying to make him king right then. And Sean Killian preached uh, on, uh, almost a year ago or six months ago the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ when he finally just says he enters in and they're throwing down all their cloaks and worshiping him. And he comes in and, and then the Holy Week begins. And in this final week of his life, the controversy with the, the religious is going to reach fever pitch. And they're going to begin challenging his authority. Where did you get your authority? We paid for ours and we earned it. <clears throat> Who do you think you are cleansing temples and throwing over all the tables, speaking with such authority? And what's interesting to me is that Jesus is intensifying it. They're growing in their enmity and, and he's just going after them. He, he's speaking these penetrating truths to these moralists, and he's not just saying, hey, let's all try to get along. You have your truth, and I've got mine. He's instead teaching them now deeper and deeper, and now this, this morning in parables. And, and if you're from the South, he's cooking their grits. He, he's coming after them, and he's just going to start revealing no more. I'm just going to tell you straight up and straight out. No wonder they wanted to crucify him. And there's three parables. In Matthew 21, verse 28, he begins the parable of the two sons. And he says to these two sons, go out and work in the vineyard. He says, the first son says, I won't. And he later regretted it. And then he went showing this picture of repentance from the Gentiles. And then the second son says, I will, I will, I'll do what you've asked. But they don't do it. And it's the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the day. And Jesus said this, truly I say to you, that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you, religious ones. They repented at John's preaching. And I just want to give you a little insight this morning. 
If you tell a religionist or a moral guy that the prostitutes are entering the kingdom and they are not, it's not going to go over very well. That's for free. So let's go to the second parable, the parable of the landowners. Jesus said there's a landowner with a vineyard that he planted, and he rents it out, and he, and he goes away on a journey. And at harvest time, he sent his slaves to receive the produce. And they took his slaves, and they beat one, they killed one, and they stoned a third. And he sent another group of slaves larger than the first, and he says they did the same thing to them. And so he said, you know what? I will send my son. Surely they're going to respect my own son. But when they saw him, they said, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize the inheritance. So when the owner comes, I love it. He says, what do you think he's going to do to those vine growers? And they have a great answer. He's going to bring those wretches to a wretched end, and he will rent it out to those who will give him the produce at the proper time. <laughs> great answer. And Jesus said, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who have produced the fruit of it. And the chief priests and Pharisees, it says they realized he was speaking about them. And they thought they would have killed him right there, but it says they feared the people. And that's our context to Matthew 22 this morning. So come with me to this parable. Verse 1, Jesus spoke to them again in a parable, saying, A parable is a story that is to teach us spiritual truth. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And sometimes he says it was to conceal truth, speaking they didn't see or understand, and sometimes it was to reveal truth. And this one he's going to tell now is going to be about a wedding banquet. <clears throat> How we respond to the offer of God's grace, the gospel and, and your response to it. And so the most important thing in all of life is what do you do with this gospel offer that God has given to all peoples? to come to a great wedding feast of the Lamb at the end of history as we know it. And that is what all of history is moving toward again, this messianic banquet. This is what is being offered in the great gospel as we're, we're getting an invite to the royal wedding. And so here's a parable that Jesus is going to tell to teach us about it. In verse 2, if you'll look with me, he said, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and so we see now the kingdom of heaven is the realm of God. It's the sovereign rule of grace. It, 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 I would call it the sphere of God's saving grace, the, the realm of salvation, those over whom the king is the ruler. And so the most important thing is to come into the kingdom of God, into the kingdom of heaven. And that's what Jesus has been preaching and offering. And that is the, the ones who will be in the great feast at the end of time. And that should, that should be the greatest burden of every heart. I want to be at the feast. I don't want to not come to the wedding. And so should, every one of you, what have I done with the gospel offer that God has so freely and graciously given to all people? And he said, this kingdom of heaven then may be compared to a king. And in this parable, the king is God the father. And he gave a wedding feast for his son. And his son is the Lord Jesus Christ the one who we're, we're celebrating, who was incarnated into the world to be the savior of the world. This feast is for his son. And so the principal purpose for this feast is going to be the son of God put on display and worshiped and adored. God loves his son. The son has given up much to come to earth on this mission to seek and to save that which is lost. And the father wants to honor the son for his great act of love to him and the ones that will come to the feast. And the father wants to exalt and magnify the son of God and give him a bride to adorn and worship him and value him and treasure him for all of eternity. And a feast that others can share in the joy that the father has for the son. And all eyes will be on the bridegroom and everything is moving toward the worship of the son of God. And so I pray this morning that your chief end and motive in life is, is where this is all moving. What will glorify the Son of God? And that is to be in step with the Spirit and the Father. And so the Son's going to be put on display at a wedding feast. And this wedding feast is going to be festive and the greatest joy. And in those days, these wedding feasts sometimes would last around seven days sometimes even a month or months. 
And so it was a great privilege and joy to be invited to these great celebrations in that day. And they were not uh, so much as pomp and ceremony and the materialism that we see in many of the weddings today, but to come and celebrate with the father and mother, their child, getting married. And it was a great honor to be invited to such a wedding. And so salvation, the first thing I want you to see, it's a very joyful thing. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, God and sinners reconciled. It's a joy to come into the feast. And the best thing that you could ever do is give your life to Jesus Christ and to believe in him and come into this feast and the celebration of what God has made. In our parable now, the king is going to send out three invitations to this great feast that he has prepared. And I want to look at these invitations because they're very insightful and we'll learn much from them. Before we begin, just one more custom of the day is that you would invite your guests long before the feast to, to, let, to let them know that, hey, the feast is coming. And, and then you would RSVP, so to speak. And because you didn't have a caterer and refrigeration and all that we have today, it was, it was much harder to prepare these feasts and get them all ready. It could take days and even months to prepare these feasts. And then when it was all ready and everything was set, you, you would go to them and you would say, it's all ready. Honored guests, come and celebrate with us at this great wedding feast. And then everyone then would, would come and they knew it was coming and they were prepared and they would go to the feast. So you would be pre-invited months in advance and you would be called when the feast was ready. Come and get it. Mom, you're here. Remember, ring the bell. Come and get it. It's dinner time. And the pre-invited guests would accept the invitation. And then uh, when, when it was ready, they would come fill the banquet hall or the home. And so with that, I want to look at our parable, what happens. Look with me in verse 3, the first invitation. And so the king sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. And so he sent out his slaves, which in our last parable, uh, it's the prophets. And so God is sending out the prophets, and they're going, and they're, they're, they're calling out um, to, to the peoples, and, and to RSVP, the ones who said they're coming. The feast is ready. Come. Come. And so they're going into the land of Israel, and they're saying, come sit at the table of the king. And what an offer, what an honor that has been given to you. I was reading about the royal wedding, I think it's a decade back, and there were 650 invitations to come into Buckingham Palace, and not one was rejected. All 650 were there because it was the biggest celebration ever. And I'm like, that's nothing compared to this invitation. Everyone who RSVP'd should come. And so we have an exclusive guest list, and, and, and it's been dispatched by God. He's been sending prophets, and they've been telling him, Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and, and they're all sent out to call the nation of Israel, come, come to God, come, I summons you, to you, you who have been invited, come to the feast, it's ready. And the analogy of Scripture, we see this is the nation of Israel, and the prophets are calling the nation, come to God. Grace through Abraham, the nations will be blessed. I think of Isaiah 55, 1, the prophet stands up speaking for God. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Come to the feast. You don't have anything, come. Come have God. Come, he offers living water. Come. All was being prepared by God for this wedding feast. And the sending of Messiah in Isaiah 53 said the suffering servant who would come and be pierced through for our transgressions and he would die in our place. And it says, come, come to God. Not by merit, not by law keeping, but by God's son's law keeping. The free offer of grace, come, come to Christ. Come to the wedding feast. And the, I think the thing that takes my breath away is in verse 3, it says they were unwilling, unwilling to come. That's our Old Testament, isn't it? Stiff-necked and disobedient people with this offer and invitation to such a feast, and they won't, 
come. They were circumcised in body, but not in heart. And God says all day long, I held up my arms to a stiff-necked and disobedient people. I just, here it is, come to the feast. I've prepared, I've, I've done everything necessary, come. And they were unwilling to accept the free offer of the gospel by the prophets. Romans 10, 21, but as for Israel, he says, all day long, thousands of years, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. In Matthew 23, in the next chapter, Jesus cries out, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were un." willing. You were the special guests, Israel. You were pre-invited to the feast. You RSVP'd. You said, we will come. We want Yahweh. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. You responded. It's ready. Come to me. But you're unwilling. You're stiff-necked. And you won't come the way that I have prepared and designed to enter into this feast. And there's just many filling our land this morning who have RSVP'd. You were raised in church, religious insiders. You've gone to church or mass all of your lives. You might have been baptized or confirmed. And you said, I'm coming. You joined the church. You took communion and says, do this until he comes again. Man, I'm coming to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You're religious, you're moral, you've RSVP'd. But the question before us this morning is, have you come to Jesus? This parable is going to flush that out for us. And I've been praying. I, I hope there's some little kids this morning who will come and some old ones who have just RSVP'd but never come to the Christ and the feast. And we'll see, how do you know? What's the difference? How can I determine? And so I, I don't want any RSVPs and you not coming. So your pastor is going to fight you this morning if all you've done is RSVP'd. Okay, I want to tear them up. <laughs> I'm after you. I'm hungry for your soul to come to this feast and enlighten and enjoy all that God has given. Verse 4, there's another invitation. Again, he, the Father, sent out other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, let's give you some more motivation. I prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered. Ron Troyer's like, I'm coming. Where is he? I'm coming. There's, there's meat. There's butchered, fattened oxen. It's all ready. Come to the wedding feast. Come. This verse just shows the patience of our king, our God. He's gracious and slow to anger and abounding in love and kindness. It's the glory of God. And he keeps extending his arms and showing the bowels of compassion. Why will you die? Come that you might have life. He sends out other slaves. A lot of commentators take that as the, the later, like John the Baptist. No, no more the king's coming. He's here. Behold the Lamb of God. Jesus himself, the apostles, they tell those who have been invited, my offer to come to the feast and celebrate with me and my son, come. It's ready. Tetelestai, it's finished. Come. It's time. The finished work of Jesus Christ. He, he did it all. He was raised. Victory. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who hung on Calvary's tree, pierced through for your transgressions, has drained the wrath of God against your sin and God's anger. Your debt has been paid in full. It's ready. You don't have to go buy a present. You don't have to come to the, to the feast and serve tables. Come. Come and feast and celebrate with me is the offer. You don't need to bring your own law keeping. You, listen to this. You don't even need to bring your own righteousness. Your prayers and all your duties, it's finished, it's done, and he's inviting you to come. The message is come to the feast. And the way into that feast, we'll see, is through Christ. And there's nothing you have to do. It's the only religion that says that. Come empty-handed with nothing to bring, simply to thy cross I claim. You just respond to the invitation. Come. 
I want you to see their response in verse 5. They paid no attention and they went their way. One to his own farm, another to his business. It's tragic. Does that take your breath away just a little bit? The king has invited you to the greatest wedding feast in the history of the world. One that has no end, forever rejoicing and celebrating the Son of God. And you RSVP'd, and I really think the RSVP is circumcision. We're the people of God, trusting in his promises, waiting for Messiah to bless the nations through Abraham's seed. We're God's chosen people. We're his favored ones. We signed up for this. Israel said yes to the invitation. But when the Son of God came and said, it's time, I'm the Messiah that you've been waiting for. I've shown you by my miracles. I've raised the dead, cast out demons. I've cured all disease. I'm the promised one and the awaited one. The consolation of Israel and you will not come. And the answer is astounding. And it's just too familiar to our own day and maybe our own heart. They went their own way. One to his farm and another to his business. How would you describe that? I would say indifference. They're just indifferent. Much like when Christ entered the world and there was no room for him at the inn. The greatest offer ever, the gospel, to this feast. Come. Come all the way to me and enter into the fullness of my joy and celebrate eternally with me the grace of your God through his Son. And you're indifferent. What you really care about is your daily bread. Instead of the bread of life, he said, if you eat, you'll never hunger again. You're just caught up in the here and now. My farm, my business, my job, work. I I don't really care about a feast at the end of history. I got bills to pay today. That's my focus. That's where all my attention is. This is some fairy tale. That isn't got my focus. That's not my concern. That's what I'm going to give myself to. I don't have time for this invitation. My life's too busy. Apathy and indifference for the gospel offer. J.C. Ryle and kind of a slant on what he said. He said, open sin may kill its thousands, but neglect and indifference will kill its tens of thousands. And apathy and coldness, is, as Matthew continues, he's going to have the parable of, the, of uh, the virgins, and he's going to keep showing those that were just apathetic and weren't ready when the king returned. And some sit here this morning in this place. You have RSVP'd. Maybe yours was baptism but you've never entered into the fullness of joy with your master through this glorious gospel. You're just sitting on the outside and, and what he's offered is fullness of joy in his presence. That's, this gospel brings you all the way to Jesus, not just to the externals and the circumcisions and all these things. It brings you right into his presence. And li- listen to verse 6. They respond, some responded this way, the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. Doesn't that feel extreme? (laughs) All the king has done has invited you to the greatest feast in the history of the world, and you don't have to bring anything, and I sent my own son to die on a cross in your place. You just get to come and rejoice in him forever? (laughs) How do you get that response? This is the greatest news ever. And I got to work on the farm. I got a job. I'm mad at you for telling me this. I hate you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to stone you for it. The parable of the landowner, they killed the servants and the son. Here it is. And this has just been my life in evangelism. There's just so many indifferent. I don't, what's the big deal? And then there's some who are so angry they could kill you right then and there because they understand what you're saying. And then there's those that enter into this great joy that can never get over the gospel of Jesus Christ. Their hearts are just taken up with it the rest of their days because they behold this. Which are you? Apathetic? I I hope maybe even a little angry this morning. I like anger because that's how you get saved. (laughs) Get a little angry. Apathetic, you're like, who cares? Angry is good. But what I want is all of both of those to be turned to great joy. 
You've been, you're being invited this morning. I'm summoning you. I'm calling you to Christ to enter into this gospel. Well, what does the king do? He's had so much patience and love for thousands of years, holding out his arms to this people, sending one prophet after another, stoning, killing them, finally his own son, and they ignore him or they're indifferent or they kill his messengers or they kill the son of God. What's God going to do? I'd like you to read verse 7 with me. The king was enraged. What? Yeah, the king has wrath. And he's held out his hands, and there's been a day, an opportunity of salvation for all, and he's been uh, posting it, publishing it, declaring, come. The king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. God's patience one day is released. And I've told you this before, his patience is, is his power holding back his anger towards sin until the day he's declared to unleash it in the day of the Lord. We see this through the Old Testament. Last week in Isaiah, the Assyrians, God came to judge Israel for all their rejection and hardness of heart. And so I want you to hear this. The invited guests were the Jews in covenant relationship with God. They RSVP'd through circumcision. And John 1.9 says that Jesus came for his own and his own did not receive him. Some were indifferent and some were hostile. And they put to death the prophets. And now Jesus, for what he is saying in these parables, they're going to kill him. And Jesus says, God's going to destroy them and their city. And in 70 AD, the Roman generals and their armies came into Jerusalem and they destroyed them and burnt down their city and destroyed the temple of God. We're told they killed over one million Jews and scattered them throughout. And he's put a judicial hardening upon this nation with a spirit of stupor to this day that we'll begin looking at in Romans 11. But I want you to notice something. That this hardening of the Jews cannot stop the king from his full plan and program. In Romans 11, he says, this has always been my plan and program. The wedding feast will go on. God's purposes will continue, and I want you to see them in verses 8 through 10. This is amazing. The nations are going to fill the banquet hall. So verse 8, then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Go to the highways and byways. Go where the people come. Flow in and out. All the nations. Go and preach this gospel. Go invite them. Everywhere, go. Tell them. Invite them in to this wedding feast. And those slaves went out into the streets, and they gathered together all that they found, both evil and good. We're going to go out and preach this to everyone. And the evil and the good are going to hear this message, and it's, a, it's an offer that is for all peoples. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. And so the, the people now are hearing, and they're, they're responding, and they're going to come into this wedding feast, and they all gather in. And so the application is, take this message to the world. Go tell. If I could say anything in 2022, I want you to be a people more and more who go and tell. That's our calling now is he hardened the Jews and we're to go to the nations and invite them into this great feast through Jesus Christ. You have a responsibility to go call. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. We should all be about this, giving our lives, hearts, resources, time to spread this message. There's going to be an amazing wedding feast and God did everything necessary to prepare it. Come, come and believe in Jesus Christ and enter in to his kingdom and this great feast that's coming at the end of history. This parable should just end here. Stop. In chapter 8, Jesus declared to, to the scribes and Pharisees, he says, you guys are going to be cast out. And Gentiles are going to be sitting at the table of Abraham. They hate that. And now it's happened. God's gathering in the nations. And don't you just think it close? It's amazing. I just feel like what a great parable. It's just powerful. Let's go to the next one. But Jesus, 
wants us to get one more really important thing understood or it would be an incomplete message. And so I want you to look at me in verse 11. Verse 11. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there was not dressed in wedding clothes. So he just came in just as he was. And I thought you said, Pastor, that's the message. You come just as you are, but there's only one way into the kingdom. And so this guy comes in saying, I'm good enough to come into this great banquet supper of the Lamb. My goodness is enough. I'm, I'm plenty. I've been invited to all the great wedding feasts in this land. I, I'm, I'm, you know who I am? <laughs> I can just walk in. I'm, you're blessed to have me here. No one can tell me I'm not good enough for the feast. You know who I am? To this day, this could be one of the most hated truths in the world. You're born in this world a white, hot-blooded sinner separated from God with enmity in your heart against Him. And you love yourself more than God. You treasure your glory more than His glory. And you are a rejecter of God. One not worthy to walk into the king's banquet. I want you to hear that. You will never be able to come into the presence of God the way you've been born in this world as a sinner. You cannot walk into this feast as you are. You'll, you'll be, you'll, you're about to see you're going to be cast out. Your righteousness is not enough to get you into this feast. All your goodness, trying to keep the Ten Commandments, being moral, will not get you in. In fact, it's a filthy rag. And this guy doesn't realize how polluted his garments are. He's smiling, thinking he's just righteous and a good guy. And just, man, I fit in here. This is where I belong. Most people here are not as good as me. So you have RSVP'd. You can come in. I've been a good man. I've been circumcised. I'm better than my neighbor. I've kept the law. Surely I'm not bad enough for hell. Let's party. That's the attitude of this person. And I want you to see what happens in verse 12. And the king said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Now he's before the king, who is absolutely righteous and holy. And he sees who this king is now. And when the king asks, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? Do you picture him kind of in sandals and a Hawaiian shirt? And just like, what are you, what are you doing? I want you to understand this. It went out to the highways and byways. Did anyone have time to go get dressed? The feast is ready. Come. Come enter in. Nobody had time to go home and get on their Sunday's best. Go to the highways and byways. Tell them to come in. It is ready. There's no time to go home and get ready for this. You come just as you are. And God will provide the necessary garment for you to come into the great wedding supper of the Lamb. You're going to have to be given a garment to enter in. You need wedding clothes to get into this celebration. And Isaiah says, you're going to get wrapped in the righteous garment of Jesus Christ. Listen to Isaiah 61.10. I love this. I will rejoice greatly in Yahweh. My soul will exult in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. You have been wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's the only way into this wedding feast, into God's kingdom. God has to give you the garments, not you. Not you thinking you can just walk in as you are being a good person. It will not work. God will provide the wedding garment to come into his end time feast. You do not go and work for it. It isn't being moral, following rules to get in. Christ came into this world and he lived the perfect life, the perfect righteousness that God required to come into his feast. To be in the presence of this God, he demands perfection. So he sent his son into this world to go live as a man 
under the law and obey it perfectly and fulfill it in all righteousness. That is what's being offered. And by grace, he gives it to us by faith, not by works. And he puts it to your account, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and he wraps you in that garment. Guys, that is the only way into the marriage feast of the Lamb. God will provide the wedding clothes for you to come in. That is the gospel of grace. There's no other way in. I love the hymn that says, Come ye sinners, poor and needy, sick and wounded by the fall. It says the only fitness he requireth is you feel your need of him. That's the only, I, I have nothing to bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. I cannot come into this feast in my own garments, my own goodness, my own righteousness. And I want you to see what happens when you stand before the king and your own righteousness. He says they were speechless. This man was probably speechless for the first time in his life. The one thing I've never seen self-righteous people be is speechless. I believe in a God of love who accepts everyone just as they are. Then you're not dressed. You keep sharing all of your views and all your knowledge of your own fitness. But there will be a day that you're going to be speechless. I've told you about a boss I had back when I was going to seminary at Galpin Ford. And my boss was a real slick, good businessman. And I just remember telling him, I said, you know, one day you're going to die and stand before God. And what are you going to say? And he smirked, and he goes, I'll have to do some pretty quick talking, won't I? I said, have you ever tried talking with gravel in your mouth? You're going to be speechless when you stand before this God, and all your jokes and all your thinking you're good is going to just melt away into a filthy garment. Our God is holy. And I want you to look at verse 13. Let this knock the battery off your shoulder this morning. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I can't tell you how serious it is to come to this feast without a wedding garment. To come in your own garments. Oh, please hear this morning. Your own righteousness, the cults have it wrong and they've done much harm. And many so-called Christian churches have got it wrong. You come in your own garment and you're going to be cast out of the best wedding feast ever and you'll be thrown into hell where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I've always wondered, is that weeping and gnashing of teeth when you realize the lost privilege and all the wrath that you'll be under forever? Because you were invited Every one of you this morning have been invited. But maybe you're just indifferent. You've come to Southside for a decade and you're still indifferent to this gospel. And some of you, when, when God presses you, you're hostile. There's a, there's a hostility that comes out against God. And some of you just say, I'm going to wait. And he closes his parable saying many are called but few are chosen. And as we've been learning in Romans 8 before we broke, the calling is this general call of God. And it's invited everyone come to the feast, but only few are chosen. And those are the ones who are going to respond rightly to Jesus Christ and come to him and believe and repent. And so those are the ones who are called. And what I want you to get from that, this idea is I'm going to go sow my oats. I'm going to go enjoy college first. I want to live a life before I come to Jesus. This is the King of Kings, man, inviting you to the feast. And I want you to hear this. Many are called, but few are chosen. The offer is going to come to an end. And it's not after you make your millions or you, you get it after college. This is the one thing you can't be wrong about. To be wrong is an eternal mistake. It's irreversible. And you're losing out on the greatest privilege. There'll be no appeal process. It will be forever when you're cast out. When God is offering, come. I've prepared the, the, everything for the feast. I, I have sent my son. He lived the life you should have. He died the death you deserved. Come to the feast. 
Don't be indifferent to such beauty. I just want to close to show you he did it all. Jesus entered this world and he did everything necessary for us to come to the feast. There's never been a more expensive feast. I've read sometimes million dollars spent on a wedding. This one cost God his own son to have this feast. And he's invited you. And he says, come. For the one who says, black enough, I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Naked, look to thee for dress. My only hope is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I need your garment wrapped around me that comes by faith. So come, O Lamb of God, I come. And for those who come to Christ, enter into the joy of your Master for this great celebration. Clothed in his righteousness, celebrating the Lamb for all of eternity in perfect unity, and we'll, we'll all be perfectly unified for all eternity saying this, Jesus is all. <laughs> He's everything. It's just to God alone be the glory that we're in this wedding feast celebrating forever. There'll be no debates, no discussions. There'll be no more free will, sovereign grace. It, it, we will just all say to God be the glory for everything has been done in Christ. What an eternal celebration we've been invited into. I don't know how you be apathetic to that, and I don't know why you would get angry at a message like that. So just close out. Just a few thoughts. Charles Spurgeon, Sean Killian's rubbing off on me. He said, you always want beggars at your feast. He says, they cheer for every dish. Hooray for the turkey. Yeah. And they just, every dish that comes out, they're just, yeah, celebrating and saying, hooray, hooray. And it just, they're just all celebrating because beggars cheer at every plate because we're undeserving of anything. And we're just sitting there going, I cannot believe this. God, you're so merciful and good. Hooray for that. Hooray. Yes. And everybody's just celebrating because we're beggars and everything's been supplied by God and he did it all. And what hit me in that is who was thrown out, who was cast out into hell from that feast? Not the sinner, but those who are good. <laughs> That's the right message for the church. It's not the, the, the blatant sinner that was just cast out. They will be cast out. But in this parable, it's the ones who were good, moral, nice guys. Is your goodness keeping you from God? I give God my Sundays. I'm a good man. I read my Bible. Is your goodness keeping you from God? Because Jesus stood and said, there's only one way into my kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I've gone over this a lot, but that Greek word, is there's two meanings. One, where you just had a little bit of money. The other is you were usually lame, blind, or crippled. And, and all you could do is hold out a cup and go, alms for the poor. If I don't get mercy, I will not eat. And he says, blessed are those in spirit who finally just say, I have no goodness of my own. My only hope is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and you come as a beggar now. He says, those are the ones who enter into my kingdom. And so I pray that your goodness isn't keeping you from Christ this morning. That all your goodness is a filthy rag. And when you stand before him, he says, what are you doing in here? You're going you're to be silenced. You'll be speechless. And so the only way into God's kingdom is not by goodness. It's by acknowledging your sinfulness. And I can't change my nature, my heart, my, the wrath of God, my condition. My only hope is Jesus Christ and his garment to come into the kingdom of God. And you know what will happen when that happens in your life? You'll cheer at every dish. And you'll begin to just be full of joy and gratitude and the things that God gives you. And instead of being a lemon-sucking Christian, you'll be these ones that just cheer at every dish. And so I pray that you've beheld what beauty God has given us in Jesus Christ. And so this morning, God's calling. I have preached you the gospel of Jesus Christ. God's begging you through me. Here's your call. Come. Come. Will you receive his son and enter into the joy of your master and then end in a feast that will beat every feast that has ever been done? 
Every wedding is a typology pointing to this great day of what is coming. And so the message to you is you're going to be indifferent, angry, or are you going to hear Jesus say, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest for your souls. Come, respond to this glorious, beautiful offer that God has given in Jesus Christ and your heart will be changed and, and you will cheer at every dish. You just, I'm so grateful for a God who gives me anything but hell. And it, it changes your life when you get your arms around such a gospel. And so I'm going to invite, there's going to be some elders up here after the service. And if you uh, need, want to come to Christ and be saved and know him, they're going to be up here to help you with that. I am doing a wedding and monument. So I am slipping out the back door right now. So I get there because without a minister, I guess you can't get married. You can, but it, it's cooler. You know. <laughs> so yeah, Timmy. All right, let me pray. Father, I thank you for this parable. I thank you for those who have faith. God, they are wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Paul said this gospel in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And Lord, this righteousness is so beautiful that we don't go merit it. We don't go earn it. He left heaven and came and he earned it. He merited it. He lived it. And now by grace through faith, you actually treat us as if we live the life Jesus lived. We now have a garment wrapped around us that we can enter into the fullness of all that you are and all your blazing holiness and glory. And, and now we, 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 we can stand in your presence blameless with great joy. And so, God, I thank you for such a gospel. I pray that there are none in here looking to their own goodness, still looking to their own hands, the things they're going to change, the recommitments they're going to do. God, I pray that every soul in here is poor in spirit looking only to Jesus Christ. So I, I thank you for such a gospel. I thank you for this beautiful parable that Jesus told. And I pray, uh, Spirit, let them have ears that hear and, and do mighty things in, in, in the saints and in any unbelievers in our midst this morning. I pray, let no one come short of Jesus with an RSVP. God, let them have nothing but Christ be held in their hands by faith. Oh, come, let us behold him. Come, let us adore him. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.